This video is brought to you by Diamond Pacific Tool Corporation. Diamond Pacific is America's favorite diamond tool, wheel, and lapidary machine manufacturers. For nearly half a century, Diamond Pacific has set the industry standard for diamond lapidary equipment. Join the majority of professional lapidaries and choose Diamond Pacific products such as their Nova Wheels, Pixie, Genie, and Titan Gem Makers, as well as their wide selection of other high-quality lapidary diamond products. Check out Diamond Pacific today and find out why they're considered America's premier diamond lapidary tool manufacturers. Here with Kenneth Goldner from Orgone Energy Devices. It's been a while, my friend. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. It's great to have you over for dinner. Yeah. Here at the Airbnb during the Tucson Gym and Mineral Show 2023. Last time we talked um, and had a video on the channel was maybe four or five years ago. At least, yeah. It felt like forever ago. Yeah. Still, people are watching that video. I'll put the link to that video up here and the uppities up there. Mm -hmm. If you haven't seen it, check it out. Um, you make high-end, actual, functioning orgone devices. It is a total mystery to some people. Um, it's, a, it's a material that's being counterfeited by others. And some people who are even selling the counterfeit stuff don't even know what it is and they're just selling it because it became extremely popular for a while. Yeah. It was really popular for a while. Um, being uh, made and represented by some of the highest people in the healing scene. Yeah. You have a few pieces. Yeah. You're wiped out. You used to have tables full. Yeah, I need to and make a lot more. This is it. I've been selling a lot lately. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, before we take a look at these and talk about these, for folks at home who might be interested in some of your devices or some of your services that we'll talk about later, yeah. um, can they is can they contact you through your email here? Yeah, email, um, my website. They can contact me through there. You need to start an Instagram. Yeah, also phone, you can text me. And if anybody was interested in or, or um, ordering any of your organ devices or any of your services overseas, cause is that something you could ship to them? Yeah, I have done a couple overseas uh, shipments. I have, uh, I think, uh, Canada and um, a couple other places. But yeah, it is possible. Yeah, you're not afraid. Yeah, you're gonna have to pay for it, but yeah. but it's worth it. Yeah. So, can you explain Organite to the folks at home who have never heard of it? Yeah, so uh, the basic idea is Orgone is kind of a third generation technology. Um, the word Organite comes from Orgone, which is a word that was coined in the 1930s by a man named Wilhelm Reich. And uh, he was a therapist who basically discovered that there was a mind-body connection. And it's a long story, but basically through his research, he realized that there was this type of energy that all living things uh, have, and it's also, uh, to some degree, everywhere in, in the universe, and, uh, but it's concentrated primarily in living things. And uh, it has a certain behavior depending on the state of health of the organism, uh, either a positive state that's uh, indicating health, good health, or a negative state that's indicating disease or even uh, heading towards death. And so he called that positive orgone and deadly orgone. And, uh, but anyway, this is a third generation development based on his original research. This type of orgone device or organite is um, made by uh, Don and Carol Croft. Um, so so they're, they're the ones that originally developed this particular uh, basic design. And what that amounts to is it's a resin casting with metal shavings or metal uh, powders and uh, quartz as well as some other stones and crystals. And um, without going into too much detail, basically the original orgone device used that, that Reich had or Reich had was a, uh, what he called an orgone accumulator, which was a box of alternating layers of metal and resin, or metal, metal and uh, wood, I should say. And the, uh, the wood and the metal had different properties in how they interacted with this energy. But basically it was layered in such a way that the energy would concentrate inside the box and it can be used for a temporary therapeutic benefit for his patients. And so other people have taken his research and developed it further. And like I mentioned before, Don and Carol Croft took that work and they added, um, they, they, so they basically added crystals to 
this uh, to an earlier generation. So the second generation was made by Carl Wells, and he has the uh, copyright, you could say, to the word organite, uh, although it's kind of almost become a household name. Because so. before that, it was mostly considered like orgone generator. Yeah, orgone is, is Reich's, or Wilhelm Reich's word. Our um, modern take on these handheld and portable orgone generators is known as organite. Typically it is, yeah. Um, so, so Carl Wells made a design with resin and metal that acted as uh, a similar uh, type of device to the original accumulator, but just in a smaller, more compact design. And then Carol and Don Croft uh, realized that they, if they added quartz crystal, um, that the piezoelectric effect, which we can talk about, actually would not only absorb the energy and concentrate it, but also bring it into that positive orgone state, which would be beneficial to living things. The version that Carl Wells made was only using the metal and resin. And what that would do is, although he did, it, he did do it in such a way that it could have some beneficial effect, but Carol and Don Croft realized that they could improve on the design uh, of, of Wells by adding quartz. And what that does is rather than just drawing in energy from the surroundings, which could be in either positive or negative state, um, and, and therefore you don't necessarily know the effect it would have. Because if a piece is absorbing uh, energy from the surroundings, and if you're in an area that is, uh, has a very negative energy, which can happen for many reasons, um, one reason could be if there's a lot of pollution or if there's a lot of uh, maybe even other types of energy that are harmful, like EMFs and things, which we'll talk about later, that, that can create a, uh, what they call a deadly orgone buildup. And so then the piece might be absorbing that. And if somebody were to come in contact with that concentration, uh, it, can, it can cause, uh, uh, you know, it could be detrimental to their health. So for example, just to mention real quickly, so some of the early work that Reich did um, in the 30s and 40s, he, he had two devices. So the first one I mentioned was the accumulator box, which he'd have his client sit in. The other one that he developed later was called the Cloud Buster. Basically all it was was metal pipes that he used tubing to connect uh, to a, a water source, either a, a lake or a stream. And the, the theory behind that was this etheric energy would be channeled through the pipe, kind of like an antenna somewhat, and it would go down into and be attracted to the water source. So the water was almost like a bank where it would store up that energy. And uh, the problem is, is that if he was in an area using this technology where uh, like one of the things he dealt with was places that had uh, drought. So it hadn't rained in weeks or months. And so that's kind of uh, uh, indicative of uh, a place that has a buildup of this deadly orgone. And so he would try to pull that out of the atmosphere with this uh, cloud buster and draw that energy and it would go down into the water source. And if enough of that energy was charging up that water, anyone that, that came in contact with that water could actually get, it would basically sap their, their strength or their energy and they can get ill. So um, you had to really know what you were doing and be careful uh, to, to work with orgone energy. Uh, as Reich did. So when, so going ahead a little bit to Don and Carol Croft, by adding the quartz crystal, basically any energy that was absorbed by the piece would be essentially altered to a positive state, um, which is basically like, uh, it's analogous to almost like qi in the Chinese tradition, where when qi is flowing, uh, it's healthier, it, it's indicative of a healthy state. And if, if that energy gets stuck or if there's a blockage in the body, um, that could be an indicative of uh, a problem with their health or even illness. And so, um, so the crystal basically facilitates uh, transforming the deadly orgone state to a positive state, uh, which is uh, healthy to life. And so if it's made properly, if the, organite, the orgone device is made properly uh, with the crystals, um, then it will not be uh, risk of having uh, any, you know, no one can get hurt from it. And and so before we start talking about the resin and the crystals, yeah, is it true that the the box that 
the gentleman would have people sit in was so successful that he wasn't allowed to do it anymore. Yeah, there's quite a long uh, story to that. And if people want to, you know, get the details, they can go on my website, watch some of the videos that go into the history. But basically, uh, he had a lot of patients that would get treatments and he never made any promises about what would happen. But the, the long story short is he realized through many trials that when people would do regular sessions in his accumulator, it might be so many minutes a, a week or whatever, um, that let's say, for example, they had cancer. Their cancer would go into remission after a certain number of sessions. However, once they stopped the session, the cancer would come back. And basically his theory was that the cancer wasn't actually a disease, like the tumor or whatever it was that was going on, wasn't really the illness itself, or at least it wasn't the root of the problem. The root of the problem was more uh, subtle. It was more, you know, it had a, an aspect that was, you know, uh, psychological, mental, or, or spiritual even. Oh, emotional illness. Yeah, emotional, is, is mental. Incredible yeah, and so basically problems. he realized that there was this mind-body connection and essentially in order to heal someone when they had a chronic or a serious illness is you couldn't just treat the body if in the long term you wanted to uh, you know get rid of whatever the illness was and so he realized that the people that would do sessions with him when they eventually left because they had remission or, or the whatever their symptoms they had were uh, were no longer there once they stopped these sessions the problem would come back because the underlying cause was still there so anyway, that's kind of the long story, but basically it, it, the idea is that those treatments weren't enough to cure the person because it, wasn't, it was only giving them a temporary boost to their physical health that wasn't getting to the root of the problem. Um, so, but anyway, he never promised anything. And even though there was all these positive results from people while they were doing the sessions, the, the government tried to go after him. It's quite a long story, but basically they couldn't get anyone who he treated to speak ill of him. Everybody had good things to say who actually worked with him, but they tried to demonize him and they basically got him uh, eventually uh, imprisoned on some technicality that wasn't even him. It was his uh, business partner that was barred from, or he was barred from shipping things against uh, across state lines and his business partner you know, violated that uh, order and because Reich refused to show up for, uh, for a hearing or something like that for court, that they threw both of them in jail. Oh, right. You know, and, and they don't do that stuff for fun. They're yeah. really good and so, at uh, stopping great things yeah, from happening he, too fast. People that think a little bit too differently. So basically, he died in prison the night before he was due f to be up for parole. Uh, what a coincidence. Yeah, it's strange. <laughs> who, who knows exactly? But in any case... Um, his while he was still alive they they had banned the sale of his books they banned completely all of his equipment and devices they were ordered to be destroyed and you know basically for the most part were destroyed and so that would be actually an example of as far as i know one of the only uh physical book burnings in the united states uh history which is most people don't know that there was a book burning. Well, you must be US. really good yeah. to get a book burning in the United right, States. Right, right. Um, can people learn more about this on your website? Yeah, absolutely. There's plenty of research. If they go to the video page, they can watch documentaries. There's even a feature film that's uh, linked uh, in there. So, yeah. But, uh, but basically, the, the issue is the modern Oregon devices don't have some of the pitfalls that the older versions do. Um, where by adding the quartz, if it's done properly, we can talk about that, that you don't, there's no danger basically to your health. There's no risk that you could misuse it. So when we talk about the quartz in Organite, we can't talk about the quartz without talking about the resin. Right. And to a lot of people out there who might be skeptical or who might think, just overlook it. They see it at gem shows. They see it at craft fairs. It's the resin. It's the quartz inside the resin that automatically makes them jump to conclusions and them thinking that this is some kind of toy or some kind of decor or decoration. But it's hand in hand. Right. So... So, and, and also there's a lot of people that are just seeing it, like they see it online maybe, or they hear about it, and they're just imitating. And maybe they don't have any uh, intention to deceive people, but because they don't study the principles involved, they don't know what they're really doing. And so when they try to make it themselves, they're just kind of visually imitating, and they don't really understand and what they're doing. 
here's the thing. Before we go too much further, yeah. some of the best, most powerful Organite will not be half as pretty as some of the worst. Yeah. A lot of the fake stuff is absolutely made to be beautiful. Yeah, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be the case, but often it is because to make Organite correctly or Orgone devices correctly, um, they need to have a high quantity of metal and, uh, and the right crystals, mainly quartz, uh, to work. And so oftentimes they can look kind of plain, like that's one of my more simple ones, but it's very functional. And uh, it's, it's, it can be done, you can make them look uh, beautiful, but it just takes a lot more effort and planning. Uh, and then it's a lot more expensive. <laughs> yeah, and, and not compromising the uh, the functionality of it. And so the resin, let's get to the resin. Piezoelectricity, the compression. Yeah. So the main thing is you have to use the right type of resin. And there's a lot of mixed information online, people making claims one way or the other about what resin to use. But basically you need a resin that shrinks when it when it's catalyzing. So the most resin, you have to mix it with a catalyst. And when you do that, there's a chemical reaction. It heats up when it's in liquid form, and then it shrinks a little bit, hopefully. If it's the right kind, it'll shrink uh, when it turns to a solid. And so whatever you've put in there, uh, when it's in liquid state, will now be encased in there once it has turned to a solid. So in order to get that compression, you have to get a type of resin that when you do that process and you mix it with the catalyst that it actually compresses and doesn't stay in the same uh, kind of shape and volume that it was when it started. So the right kind of resin to use would be a polyester resin. Uh, typically it's, uh, it comes in different grades, but you know, clear and brown, but basically the uh, polyester resin is often referred to as fiberglass resin because usually it's used like for repairing, you know, boats and cars. Um, and so like automotive or marine resin is typically that type of polyester. Oh, interesting, so like a casting resin wouldn't be ideal because it's designed not to shrink. Um, it depends, it depends on which one. So there are, there are different casting resins, like there's art resin, there's, there's a soy resin, there's epoxy. Most people will use epoxy or soy or what, I think there's something called eco resin. But anyway, none of those are really gonna create enough compression. So if you were to buy uh, a polyester or a so-called fiberglass resin, that would actually be the correct kind. Uh, but typically the, the fiberglass resin that you would buy uh, in the store would be brown, so it's not gonna look as nice, but you can buy a clear version. And, uh, but any, any case, technically, it's called polyester resin, and that's the correct type of resin to use for the maximum benefit because you're getting enough shrinkage to create a piezoelectric uh, charge. Now, I just want to say one thing, although it's a little technical. Some people say, well, when you, uh, one of the criticisms I've heard is they say, well, when you compress quartz, you know, because the resin is, is a constant pressure, and once you have that equilibrium uh, where it's the, the pressure has equalized, that you'll no longer have a piezoelectric effect. However, because of what's happening with the metal, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, it's being stimulated by, um, there's, a, there's kind of a, a force that's generated between the metal particles, um, and that, is, that comes from any energy or radiation in the environment that will create a, a, a force in those particles, and that will re, activate that piezoelectric effect in the crystal. So it's constantly getting uh, reactivated. So it does, uh, it is actually, um, the piezoelectric effect is actually continuing to be generated inside the piece, despite claims to the contrary, just for. Yeah, we were talking earlier, you know, um, when it comes to acoustic guitars, piezoelectric guitars, it's under constant pressure yeah. all the time. Yeah. And that's what's making it work. Yeah. You know, so I, I think that... Well, what I'm saying is, is that with the piezoelectric effect, for people who are more in the science field, they might be concerned to say, well, you know, you have to have, um, you have to vary the pressure or pulse the pressure or, or something like that to get the piezoelectric effect to continue. And, um, but the point, of, the point of that is just in case people have that concern, um, that it's actually being, the, the piezoelectric effect is being re-stimulated because there's a push-pull force generated in the, in between the metal particles that are inside the resin, uh, and that's called the Casimir effect. 
so, or a Casimir force. Uh, basically, when you put two metal uh, surfaces very close together without touching in physics, um, there's actually a, an attractive force between them. And so because you have many different metal particles all mixed in this resin, there's going to be a push-pull in all these different directions. It's microscopic forces, but basically this, this constant tension um, will, will reactivate the pressure on the crystal, and so it creates a, a fluctuation that will keep the, the whole piece working. So it, ne it never needs to be recharged or uh, it never stops working as long as there's energy in the environment, which there always is. Um, it will always work, uh, uh, barring that the thing doesn't break in half and the crystal falls out, it'll still work. Um, so on the topic of the metals, um, can you tell us a bit about Ormus? I believe that there was a form of Ormus used in like ancient form of organite. Like organite wasn't just isn't a modern thing. I believe some people believe that it was used in ancient Egypt and some other cultures um, um, back in the day. I possibly I, I I would have to look at that to research again. But I know there's a lot of ancient technologies that are that are talked about. Um, things have been discovered in in uh, you know ruins and tombs and things that seem to resemble similar things. So I wouldn't doubt that. Um, but. I would have to look into that to, to be able to answer you more specifically. But I can say that um, with the orgone, um, ormus is a particular type of metal. And ormus is an acronym. It basically stands, you know, O-R-M-E-S or O-R-M. Sometimes it's spelled with a U. But the acronym O-R-M-E is Orbitally Rearranged Monatomic Elements. So basically they're elements or metals that um, instead of being in molecular form where there's multiple atoms bonded together chemically, um, so like gold that we think of having the gold color, that's molecular gold. So there's multiple atoms of gold in a, in a molecule, whereas if you were to have a monatomic gold, mon means one, so monatomic means one atom, all the atoms are separated from each other and they, they're not bonded together. And so if you were to have pure monatomic gold or ormus gold, in theory, it would look like a white powder. Um, and so it doesn't have the normal metallic properties that, that more, you know, the molecular gold that everyone's used to seeing uh, has. So there's many different types of metals that have been found or generated in a monatomic state. And so I use some of the monatomic metals uh, in my in my work, and that it gives it a further benefit, um, and that's a whole explanation in itself. But the simple point that I can make real quick is that because I'm using that fine metallic powder, um, which is the ormus, that it's creating that Casimir force, meaning that the attraction between two pieces of metal separated by a small gap, you know, in mil millions of different times. So if you were to look at this little layer of of that brown layer, that's very very fine metal powder that's mixed inside the resin so if you were to like look at that under a microscope it would basically be millions of little bits of metal that are separated by you know a, a microscopic amount of resin so you're creating millions of little gaps between millions of little uh, bits of metal and that's just enhancing that casimir force that uh, that attract push pull force between all those metal particles and that so that is basically uh, any energy radiation EMFs or whatever that gets drawn into that piece uh, or passes through that piece is going to be bouncing around and creating that push-pull Casimir force uh, and then the and then the energy would then be uh, through the piezoelectric effect meaning the polarized positive negative charge on the quartz crystal that's what piezoelectric means um, it's basically realigning all the energy um, or, or filtering it or restructuring it. So basically it's creating coherence. So something that has a similar structure to itself or it's, or it's a repeating pattern is considered coherent. And so just a, a general principle to point out is with all living things, uh, our body is a complex system that needs coherence and um, you know, self-similarity throughout. So we have, we have a lot of um, electrical, and chemical and even electromagnetic signals in our body and everything's very finely tuned 
And so if you interfere with that, it can cause a lot of problems. So basically what orgone is doing or what orgone devices are doing is creating a situation where it takes energy that is in an incoherent state or not well structured uh, and creating, uh, altering that energy so that it is in a coherent state. One of the best examples of that is water. And there's a whole body of research on structured water and destructured or not structured water, what they call bulk water. And your body is, you know, our bodies are made of mostly water. So um, one of the things that orgon can do, the orgon device can do is basically help to keep the water in your body in a structured state, which is they call fourth phase of water. It's like a gel-like state. Uh, it's a it's a long story, but basically you can you can research that. Uh, I think the little bit I've heard might come from some research done by a Japanese man. Uh, so yeah, so Masaru Emoto was one of of many people that have uh, delved into the fourth phase water or structured water, and it's a it's a complex you know topic. But basically, what what orgone is doing, what orgone devices are doing, are creating coherence. And that is something that is basically beneficial to our health. We want, we want things to be in a coherent state. So any energy that we might be exposed to, like EMF radiation, um, if it is not in a coherent state, so if there's a lot of modulation in the energy, meaning there's a lot of fluctuations in the wave or pulsations and other things, that that can be uh, like interference in a sense to our health. And so this will mitigate that to a certain degree. Fantastic. Yeah. And um, so how long have you been making orgone devices? I would say it's been about 13 years now, as a, just a little over 13 years. Uh, I started in late 2009 and, uh, you know, doing it for as a, as a passion and a hobby for most of that time. And then in the last couple of years, doing it full time. That's really respectable, and it's not just making these and the the making the money. It's the passion about the hearing. No, absolutely. I mean, it's it's totally about the mission, you know. Um, it's not about I, – I just made it into a business basically so I could spend more time doing what I love to do, which is, you know, trying to give back and do something positive for the world in any way that I can. There's a lot of movements, I believe, of people – um anonymously working with these putting these places yeah selfless yeah. you know sometimes it's, it's very expensive yeah. to make the authentic stuff sometimes yeah. Yeah. um yeah. yeah they call it the gifting movement where people will make some and then they'll go around their local community and leave pieces in places that seem to need it like uh near uh cellular towers or other other spots like that um and uh, i've done that some myself too but uh, yeah, it can be an ongoing challenge because there's, there's claims that these are being, I don't know if it's true, but there's claims that sometimes they're, when they're found, uh, that they're being removed. So that's a whole question of why would that happen and Here's the thing. why would that be? I don't, I don't if, know. If, if it's, as, it's, it's, as, it's, as, it's, as, it's the same thing as if you can use devices to find out that they're working, then you can use devices to find out where it's working why would it be working? Don't don't we need people to be suffering now? Isn't this part of, you know, said people's master plan? You know, don't they want... Well, so they, there's an idea that some people in power want suffering. Need this thing to control in a certain way. Yeah. And so I totally believe it. if it's working, there's no way that it's not being removed. And there's probably some big ones that are disguised in day-to-day -day life as statues and sculptures, the same way that some of those things might be even dangerous to us that we don't even realize. The opposite of organite and stuff yeah. that are disguised in day-to-day -day yeah. life as sculptures and art and all this other stuff. <coughs> um, and there's so much more about this than what people have thought they knew about this material. Unfortunately, because it was so popular, Mm -hmm. It anything that's popular or worth money is going to get counterfeited. Yeah. There's people at the gem show who don't know why they are selling these resin right. pyramids with with copper plated spirals, right. and they have no idea. They think they think it's decor. Right. 
Right. And it's what the industry calls glitterite. Yeah. It's it's fake organite. Yeah. You, you can't really get mad at them. They don't know. Also, they don't know half of the materials that they're even right. selling. They're just getting it because it makes money. Yeah. Um, yeah, and typically the, the two biggest things that people do wrong, one I kind of indicated before, which is they use the wrong kind of resin because there are other resins that don't work as well, but they look really nice. So epoxy and soy, they have a really nice finish. You could use them as like a, as like a top coat, but they won't work as the main casting. But the other thing that they mess up is because they're just trying to like visually imitate it and they say, I'm gonna make it as beautiful as possible. And again, don't, there's nothing wrong with trying to make something beautiful, but they need to make it work correctly. And what they tend to do is they don't put enough metal in. So they might put like 90% stones or, or right, some kind of other- Right, because that's what they think looks good. Yeah, some kind of beautiful thing. And then they, if they put any, they might just put a sprinkle of metal. And what they don't understand is, is most of the effect is, um, through that Casimir force, that push-pull between the, the closely spaced metal particles. And if you don't have enough of that, you're not going to gather enough of the energy and radiation from the environment and to have it be altered in a positive way as it's re-released. So it's constantly absorbing and emitting energy. It doesn't really block energy for the most part, but it's primarily just altering it. And so if you don't have enough metal in the piece, about 50-50 by volume or close to that, uh, metal to resin, if you don't have it somewhat in that in that ballpark of that measurement, then you're going to have a lot less of an effect, uh, if any. And so, like you said, they're get, they're making this, you know, fake, uh, you know, what the, fake orgone or glitterite, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and uh, it's just it's just well, the, the the issue is is that it's actually harming the movement because a lot of people will hear about orgone. Or organite, and CDs, they might go and buy one yeah. and say, "Oh, this looks like organite. It's something." And, it, and in it's resin. got a Grateful Dead skull similar. inside of it. And, and, yeah, yeah. And it's got and some pieces of fake turquoise in there. Yeah, and they'll buy it, and if they have any, you know, kind of sensitivity or awareness at all, they'll they'll quickly realize I don't feel any benefit from this, and uh, and then they'll just write it off, and they'll say, "Well, all organite is a hoax," and it's like, you know, it's sad. So what I I say to that is. You know, even though I'm doing this as a, as a business now, um, I would rather have somebody who's making it incorrectly. I would rather teach them and say, look, if you just change these few things and make it correctly, that would be better for the movement as a whole. Even if I lose a sale or two or whatever, and you make some more money, that, that's more important to me than selling people stuff that doesn't really work uh, or at least not work as well as it could and then it be written off by the community. You know what I mean? So that's really what matters is get, teaching people to make it correctly, at least at a basic level, getting the basics down correctly, so that when they're selling it, that they make something that works and it, has a, it gets a better reputation than it has gotten. I think you were passionate about the medicine before, even the art. Yeah. Like I, I, you would rather show these people who are making, you know, I have a lot of friends who are really into it but they are using the soy because of the idea that it's a superior resin because it's healthy. Yeah. It's not about yeah. this resin that you're wearing against your body. It's about this tool. It's a, it's a, it's this, this battery, this, this, um, healing device in mm -hmm. some things you can make it better, perhaps by more, um, different types of metals, more pure metals that are, or specific metals rather, not pure. Yeah, that would like work gold better. Or copper. Yeah, and which can be very expensive. I believe right. some of your Ormus actually uses gold. Yep. And uh, I know some of your stuff. You sell one thousand dollar pieces that you're not making double your money back on, dude. You're not making sometimes a third of your money back on. Yeah. Well, and also like a piece like this. That has the Ormus layer in the back, which is that brown metal powder. I don't know if you can see it real close. Oh, yeah. But basically, and then there's this layer here, which is uh, like a 24 karat gold leaf. So that's regular, you know, molecular gold, the kind of gold we're all familiar with. And that's pure 24 karat gold. So I do both the, the Ormus and the real gold for the higher end pieces. And yeah, it's it's more expensive, but again, the effect is better. Um, and there's, there's kind of what they call subtle energy aspects of it. Like if people who are energy sensitive, um, when you use metals that are, um, you know, metals like steel, titanium, things like that, the energy of the piece, if you have any energy sensitivity, it almost feels almost like a cool 
sensation, like a cool breeze kind of uh, feeling. Uh, some people describe it as when you have a piece that has copper or gold in it, uh, it seems to transform the energy that's emanated by the piece where it almost has more of a warm feel. And not everyone's going to feel this, so it's kind of a subtle thing. But for people who are used to that kind of effect, they can notice that difference, especially with the larger pieces, like you were saying. Um, so the original Cloudbuster, uh, there's a modern Organite or Orgone device version of that. Uh, sometimes it's still referred to as a Cloudbuster. The other ver the other word for it is Chembuster. But basically, it's a it's a large piece of Organite as the base, and it's usually designed to be put outside. And um, there's six. The typical design is six one-inch copper pipes uh, that go up about six feet, um, and you can make it any height. But the essentially the copper pipe acts as like an antenna, both receiving and sending energy over many miles. And um, so anyway, the reason for bringing that up in this case is if you were to put your hand over the pipes, the ends of the pipes of one of these devices, which I don't have with me because I, I sold my last one, but uh, you can look and see them on the website and, and some of the videos. But if you put your hands over the top of the pipe, um, if, the, if the base, the orgone uh, resin part has any um, of the copper metals or gold or anything like that, the energy that will be coming off of the tops of the open pipe will have almost, people will describe it as almost like a warm breeze uh, or a warm tingling sensation. And then um, if you're sensitive to it, like I said, and, but if the piece, if the orgone base of the chem buster is only made with metals like steel, titanium, or even aluminum, which I don't really use, um, then the people tend to describe that as having almost like a cool breeze or a cool, a cool sensation. So the energy is altered by that. But anyway, that's kind of an aside. So yeah, but, but the metals that you use do have an effect. I typically don't use aluminum. That's another controversial thing kind of within the orgone community. And I, I don't, I'm not like a, a hard liner and say, oh, you absolutely can't use aluminum. Um, there's people that do it and it still can have a beneficial effect. I tend not to use aluminum because it seems to alter the energy in a way that I don't really like. And it's kind of a long story, but that's the long story short of why I avoid using aluminum because it, it seems to, uh, it seems to interfere in a sense with, with the energy. <laughs> You're really good at letting people know you don't like something without being rude. Well, you're not judging you know, anybody but, for but I mean, if that, aluminum. If you were going to use aluminum and that's all you had, <laughs> as long as you follow the other principles that I that I said, you're still going to get something that's better than than nothing or better than people that don't know what they're doing. Um, especially for like EMF uh, remediation, where it's going to help to uh, mitigate the negative effect of EMFs, you know, wireless radiation and such on your health. But again, it's not the ideal. And if you don't have to use aluminum, I don't see really that it's necessary. If you can find, you know, metal shavings uh, from a machine shop that's steel or some other metal, or even just cutting up, you know, some people cut up steel wool. I don't usually do that because I have a machine shop that I get. Oh, interesting. But, but you can do that, you know, if you're willing to sit there and cut it up and, uh, you know, something like that. But, you know, I say, why use it if it's, if it's not the ideal? Um, so yeah, that's my take on aluminum. So yeah, one other thing I wanted to talk about was there's different terminology for some of these things. And one of them is a term that's used somewhat on more of the scientific uh, side, um, especially in Europe and uh, in Asia, Russia, things like that. Cause a lot of, a lot of alternative science research has been done in those regions, uh, Russia, um, in the past and, uh, and other places. But, and then of course there's people like Tesla that every, most people have heard of Nikola Tesla, um, who worked with, you know, what they call radiant energy, but, um, scalar energy in terms of this alternative type of energy, cause there is a, there is a, a mathematical or mainstream science term for scalar. So the word scalar in general just means a quantity that has a, a number value, but it doesn't have a particular direction. So you could say, you know, I'm driving, you know, 50 miles an hour on the road. If, if that's all the information you have, then it's telling you a quantity, you know, like 
the quantity of your speed, but it doesn't tell you if you're driving north, south, east, or west, or whatever. So uh, the opposite of a scalar would be a vector. But the reason there's this whole other, in this alternative science and in the field of like orgone and subtle energy and things like that, they came up with this term uh, for what they call scalar energy or scalar waves. And that implies a, a type of energy that doesn't have a particular direction. So light and EMFs and things like that, that's a type of energy that has a direction. It has a, what we would call a vector. So it's how, how much and which way. You know, how much, how strong is the energy and which way is it heading? Where, where is it pointed? Um, so that's what makes it a vector. Anyway, I'm getting technical, but the point is scalar energy, although it's not quite the same um, exactly as the traditional use of the term in math or physics, it is still a valid uh, term because it refers to a type of energy, um, you know, orgone or subtle energy that it, it spreads out and travels in all directions. So it doesn't have a particular direction that it goes in. And uh, a lot of this research talks about some of the properties of it, and you can research that on my website. But um, it, some of it kind of bends or even seems to break the laws of physics or the known laws of physics, like saying, uh, you know, the speed of light is the fastest, whereas scalar fields uh, may be able to travel faster than light. Anyway, but the point is, there's a lot of devices and technologies being sold similar to orgone <clears throat> being marketed and some of them talk about scalar energy or torsion fields torsion would be like a almost like the shape of like a donut or like a spiral around a, a tube and uh all, all similar terms but what i wanted to point out is the thing about orgone technology or at least its history goes back all the way to to Wilhelm Reich in the 30s. And uh, that's one of the original, you know, applications of scalar energy. So when people start talking about this term for scalar, you know, this is really one of the true originals in our, at least in the modern times. Because uh, as you mentioned before, there may have been advanced technologies that were kind of lost or, or uh, you know, suppressed from ancient uh, times, but that's a whole other topic. But yeah, as far as modern times is, um, this is one of the, the originals for that. So it does truly create a scalar field, a scalar energy uh, wave, if it's made correctly, as we already covered. So that was just something I wanted to point out. Um, and yeah, just to recap on, uh, you know, the fundamental thing that Orgone is doing is it's creating coherence, it's creating structure. And most living things like us were made with mostly water and one of the key ways that you can test orgone to see if it's working is by doing what's called the orgone ice water test where you take a piece of orgone or organite and you put it in a freezer with a glass of water next to it or if you can you sit the glass on top of the organite and you leave it in there long enough for the water to freeze and if you do this when the water freezes it will have a spiral or a cone shape type pattern in the, in the crystallization of the ice that wouldn't be there if you just freeze a glass of water by itself. I mean, how many times have people froze a glass of water and seen that naturally? Right. It's probably extremely rare in nature. Yeah. The, and, the, um, the one caveat though is because orgone, it, the energy, uh, it absorbs into objects in, in its area very readily. The rule of thumb is if you have a piece of organite, uh, especially if you're someone that has it in your home or whatever for a long time, it's gonna be absorbing into the walls and even possibly like if you're using a refrigerator or freezer, uh, you could get a, a, an effect in the ice even without the organite right next to it. Potentially, if you're, if you're someone that has these devices around your home because that energy is absorbing into everything. Um, so you might not be able to get that effect unless you go somewhere with a freezer that doesn't, use, that doesn't have any organite uh, type devices there um, so you have a, a proper scientific control, do the water, you know, take the glass of water and freeze it by itself where there's no orgone technology in the vicinity. And then secondarily do the test where you have the glass of water with the orgone device. And then you can s compare the two and see that there really is a difference. So just making sure it's, you know, the procedure is correct if you want to actually do a scientific experiment. So yeah, just a few other things I wanted to mentioned, but um, there's lots of other info we could go over, and I really appreciate you 
talking to me, um, David. And uh, if anyone wants to know more, they can go on my website, orgone.rocks. So www.orgone.rocks. And they can learn more there or contact me if they have questions. Fantastic. And what is a good science experiment need to be proven true? Consistency. Yeah. Yeah. Repeatability. Yeah. And a control test. All right. So something new that I am now doing as of uh, this past year is I do offer professional EMF consulting in home or at somebody's place of work, whatever the case may be. And uh, what I do is I basically go to your home and I take measurements of all the different types of fields. So EMF, magnetic fields, electric fields, and some other um, things to measure, uh, like dirty electricity. Um, and there's another test I'll go over as well. Uh, and do a personalized, in-depth uh, analysis of everything going on in your home and figure out what are kind of the levels of radiation and how they might be affecting you and sit down with you and help you understand what's going on and uh, give you strategies as well as uh, products, uh, possible solutions to those problems. So... Um, yeah, and here I have some of the meters that I use to measure different types of energy. There's a bit of confusion about what the different fields are. So on the far right, uh, the first meter that I have, that's for EMF. Now EMF as a term gets often used as a blanket term to just mean radiation, but technically EMF, which stands for electromagnetic fields, um, it actually only stands for wire, it refers to wireless radiation. So the electromagnetic spectrum in physics is actually only the wireless radiation. But in this case, we're talking about the type of radiation that's used by our wireless devices, which is in the part of the spectrum referred to as microwaves. So basically we're looking at the microwave band uh, and sometimes the higher frequency, like the newer technology, like 5G, um, which uses the microwave band, but as well extends up into the higher end microwave, also known as millimeter wave, because it's something that's between a centimeter and a millimeter wavelength. But anyway, this device, uh, this EMF meter measures those frequencies, those fields. So, um, and then we have other types of fields, which are technically not EMF, but they are related. Um, but like I said, a lot of people confuse the terms. Even I've even seen government websites, they'll, they'll use uh, EMF to describe all the fields. Um, and what I mean by that is magnetic fields and electric fields are technically not EMF because EMF, basically EMF is photons. So, um, you know, that includes visible light, um, you know, microwave, like I said, radio wave. And then on the other side of the spectrum, past visible light, you have ultraviolet, you have uh, gamma rays, x-rays, um, but those are all, those are all EMF. But then aside from EMF, you have magnetic fields and electric fields. And the major difference between them, um, I know I'm getting a little technical, but basically the electromagnetic spectrum in simple terms would be considered both light that you can see and other frequencies, which is basically like light, but it's, it's not visible to the eye. So we don't typically call it light, but it's essentially the same type of energy, just at a different wavelength. Um, th that type of energy, whenever it's generated, um, it will travel away from wherever it was generated. So if it's your cell phone, it, it's, you know, the antenna in your phone generates the EMF and then it travels away to wherever it's going to go and it keeps going. Um, but magnetic fields and electric fields, they stay near uh, the devices. They stay within so many feet or meters from the device. So it's a little bit di different type of energy. So the, the middle uh, meter that I have here is a meter for measuring those type of fields. And I can do an assessment of, of that because the, these fields all have uh, potentially harmful effects on your health. Um, now, not all EMF and not all forms of magnetic uh, fields are 
necessarily harmful. I want to make that clear. There are some EMFs even, um, or even in some cases, magnetic fields that in the right conditions uh, can be used for therapeutic purposes. So it, I'm not making a blanket statement that all types of radiation are harmful in all situations, but most of our modern devices, our phones, the cell towers, uh, our computers, all our, all our uh, wonderful gadgets that we have are designed in such a way that doesn't really take our, uh, our health into account. So they could be designed in a way that, um, that would be a lot less harmful or even uh, beneficial. But uh, anyway, so I assess these fields. And then the third thing I have here is basically a multimeter or a voltmeter. Uh, it measures other stuff too, but um, the point is the first two meters that I use measure uh, fields in the, in the area, so in the air. So basically whatever's the radiation in the room. But another way to assess that is not as common is our body um, is actually a very good antenna. In other words, it picks up energy from the surroundings very readily. Now, for anyone who might be a little bit older, uh, back in the day when we had television with the uh, like antenna on top of the TV, and you know the, the experience of walking up to the TV and you grab hold of the antenna while you're trying to adjust it to get a better picture, um, that while you're holding the antenna, the picture suddenly looks better, and then when you let go of the antenna, it might get fuzzy again. So the point is, is our body is a very good natural antenna. So the point is, is when you've got all these uh, radiation, these fields that we're trying to measure, your body is what we're most concerned about. So we want to see how much of that radiation your body's actually absorbing. So this voltmeter, this multimeter, I use to assess how much of that radiation is, is being absorbed by the body by testing the voltage on the skin. So we should only have a small DC voltage, meaning direct current, so it's a steady voltage constant that's very low like in the millivolts um, but I'm gonna what I do is I measure alternating current or AC voltage so voltage generated by alternating current so it's a fluctuating voltage and you shouldn't really have any of that on your body so if there is a significant amount of that that means that it's a it's a good way to measure directly that your body is absorbing a significant amount of the fields in your home and that uh, you know, certain things need to be done to mitigate that. And that's basically what I do. And I have all kinds of strategies uh, that I can offer as well as other products and services to help depending on your situation and your budget. Um, yeah, so do you have any questions about, about that? Yeah, definitely. If anyone was interested in your service, do you go to them or do they have to yeah, come to you? Yeah, I, I would travel to your, to your home. Now, I'm... I'm based in Northern Arizona, um, so most of my work for now is in that area. If I had to travel a, a greater distance, it is possible, but um, I might you know, have to be uh, charging a little bit for the travel fees. That's not gonna bother a lot of yeah, people yeah. who are but interested just, in it. But just the, so people know, yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but for local stuff, yeah. It's, it's not something flat. you can do over a Zoom call. No, because you have to measure the stuff right there, and it's also a process where the, the person uh, the people who are living there need to be involved in the process. It's not a passive thing where I just go around and take measurements. You're involved every step of the way because it's really about you. It's about making sure that, you know, you're in a safe environment and how the fields affect you it might be, uh, you know, everybody's body is different. And although it, it, it's more or less similar, uh, there are some differences in how uh, each of us can be affected. Uh, so I wanna, it's personalized is the point. And so the, the, the client would be involved in the process so that I see how the environment that they're living in is affecting them personally and try to mitigate it with them in mind. So, uh, yeah. And so a lot of your service isn't like 30 minutes, an hour. No, actually it, it can take several days, usually, uh, you know, three, four hours uh, a session. Um, and I, I charge per job, not per, uh, not per hour. I find that that makes it less stressful and it's just easier and more clear cut. Um, unless there's some, you know, extra special thing that I have to do, or uh, basically I, I, est I give an estimate based on the size of the home for the most part. Um, so it just makes it a little easier to figure out. 
Fantastic. Mm-hmm. And um, will you chat? Do you chat a little bit more about this service on your website? Uh, yeah, there is a page I have. Uh, I'm still adding more uh, info on there, but there is a, a page that links on my main page to learn about the consulting services that I do. And of course, after doing all the consultation and my recommended um, remediation strategies and any products that I might recommend, because there's many different uh, products that can help mitigate different facets of you know, magnetic, uh, electric, or EMF fields. Um, then after all that said and done, and people have a good understanding of how, it, it's really about a whole lifestyle. So it's not just, you know, fix a few things here and there. It's really the helping get people in the right mindset and, and have the right awareness. But having said all that, once that's all done, I would then also uh, offer, uh, it, if it's appropriate, um, the, the orgone devices that I make as an additional benefit for any kind of EMFs that might be, or other fields that might still be left over that we haven't been able to completely uh, eliminate. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. And um, do you plan on doing any shows where folks might be able to catch you in the Arizona area? Shows like? Uh, like trade shows or metaphysic shows or anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, um, right now we're in Tucson. Uh, so it's the gem show for 2023 but um yeah i do a lot of shows up in the northern arizona area and i'm just slowly expanding as i find uh, as i learn about more events i can do so yeah is there anywhere that you upload where you might be and let people yeah know? actually my website i put upcoming events on my website so oh, if go to my website orgone.rocks um then they can there's a link at the top that says upcoming events. I'll tell you the truth, Kenneth. Usually mo- most people's website is the last place that they will work on. Yeah. It's like, oh, I'm going to work on my TikTok and my Instagram right. well before yeah. I work on my website. Yeah. It's really cool to see that you're keeping your website up to date and mostly, stuff. Mostly, yeah, mostly. I, I do, and as far as like social media goes, like uh, I don't really have a lot of social media and I kind of done that on purpose. Um, I mean... Among other reasons, if I'm doing things to kind of mitigate and get people away from exposure to the devices, which again, it's not totally realistic <laughs> yeah, get to eliminate, the- <laughs> but it, it would be kind of ironic if I were to have like a huge social media Follow me following. on your phone for my daily like lessons on not using your phone. Right. <laughs> so it's kind of a double-edged sword. But of course, since most people are on their social media anyway, it's kind of like, well, maybe I should be on there a little bit just so they can find me. So it's kind of a, a push-pull scenario, but I try to balance it out by, you know, not doing it too much, but still having a website and, you know, this video, of course, and a couple others. And, and there's there are alternatives yeah. to cell phone usage and stuff. Yeah. For instance, um, wired Ethernet Absolutely. computers. Yeah, and that's one of the things I do uh, recommend in my consultations is giving people m- multiple options depending on what they're comfortable with. And one is you can still have your your cell phone, although again, it's not ideal, but if you have your phone... You can buy a um, dongle you to connect a, to the Ethernet. Actually, you can buy an adapter that will go in your charging port, and then it's just a, a few inches long, and then has the port for the Ethernet, which is the wired internet. It's called an RJ45 cable, and then you plug that in. So you would have the, the wired internet set up in your house, which I can help you do, and then you just, whenever you need to get on the internet through your phone, um, if you want that wired connection, which is not only safer for your health because you don't have the wireless radiation, but it's a faster connection than wireless and it's more reliable connection. You know, you know the Wi-Fi can drop uh, more frequently, but wired connection is a lot more reliable. <laughs> You'll literally so you get the most right out, of, out of what you're paying for. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So that's just one small example of many things. Um, but, yeah, there's a lot of options like, you know, you can have your cell phone, but then when you're home... You, if if the service is available in your area, you could potentially get like a wired, uh, like a corded landline phone, which is pretty, you know, old fashioned, but it's a lot better for your health. So if you're on a long call and you're at home, you don't have to be on your cell phone. You know, why do that? So there's a lot of options, um, but that's just one of them. Yeah, so we were talking about, um, we wanted to cover a little bit about the health effects of, you know, why is this even a concern? 
and it's very controversial and it's a topic we could talk about almost endlessly, but I just wanted to give some simple points. Um, so again, there's, there's three basic things, uh, the, the wireless, which is the microwave or EMF, and there's magnetic fields, electric fields, and then also what we call, um, uh, power quality, uh, it's commonly called, uh, when you have dirty power, it's commonly called dirty electricity. Uh, and basically dirty electricity is just when you have un, uh, inconsistent voltage in the wiring, um, that it creates the electric field that's pulsating and it's basically disruptive to your health. So anyway, I just want to mention that real quick, but in general, um, the problem that we have is that we have an industry that is essentially what is known as a cap their captured agency. So the regulators that are supposed to regulate the safety and health of what, of what they're, uh, overseeing in this case, uh, telecommunications and the infrastructure around that are, uh, captured by the industry. You know, the telecommunication industry has influence over, uh, the, the regulators. Um, but the bottom line is, is even, even aside from that, the real fundamental thing is that the controversy over whether or not there's health effects of any kind, whether, and, and even here's an interesting thing. So the industry didn't not only denies that there's negative health effects from non ionizing radiation and magnetic and electric fields, uh, but that they also deny that you can be used for therapeutic effects. Right. There's a lot of, there's, I mean, I'm a big conspiracy guy and we don't need to go any, down any rabbit holes, no. but you never hear about good radiation. Right. And, um, yeah. that perhaps some bad radiation yeah. that was used in past technologies yeah. might've actually been good. Yeah. Well, so good that they would want you to think that it's bad. Well, and I'll give you a simple example. So there's a device, I forget the exact name, but it's basically, there's a device that's used by the military and it's a, it's a small device that uses uh, light and infrared to help accelerate uh, wound healing for, for soldiers. So that's, that's the public thing. You can look that up. No woo woo. And no it, conspiracy. it's used by the it's U.S. military. Thing. It's a thing. And so, and that's EMF. I mean, light and, and infrared and things like that. That's, that's on the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, the fact that they use that, um, is, is proof that there's a therapeutic benefit to certain EMFs and certain, you know, conditions and certain situations if it's done correctly. So it's all the, 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 the devil's in the details. Yeah, yes, a lot of our EMFs are harmful, but, um, but they don't all have to be. And so that's why we can make, uh, we could potentially make technology that is, that is a lot safer. That's what I was gonna say. I was gonna say, I bet you that they could make certain things that we use in our day-to-day -day life actually healing yeah like you're being on your phone could be healing potentially <laughs> you yeah. know what i mean so so the bottom line is is that the industry assumes that there's only really two ways to cause harm and so the point is it's not just proving that there's harm it's that their fundamental assumption of what could possibly be harmful or not is a false assumption okay in other words their premise if you ever understand the word premise. So their fundamental assumption is, is a false assumption. And what that is, is they assume either ionization, meaning energy that's strong enough to, to knock an ion or, or break a chemical bond um, is one way to cause damage. Meaning if it happens like, like x-rays or gamma rays hitting your body could break chemical bonds and damage DNA. And that's known to be harmful. So that's very high frequency, but so they assume that's one way, and, and that is one way you can cause harm. The other way that they assume is the only way is heating, so heating of tissue. And so they say if it doesn't heat tissue, then it, then it can't cause harm. And then they, they force you to, they kind of force the public conversation to be around those assumptions. And if it doesn't fit into those assumptions, then oh, then it's safe. So they're, so they're almost like stacking the deck in their favor and saying, well, if, if it's not this, or, or they'll just claim there's no evidence. But if you don't look for evidence in other realms beyond those two assumptions, you're not going to find it. And uh, so anyway, the, the bottom line is, is that it, it's been proven many times that you don't need to cause heating effects or have ionization in order to have uh, harmful effects. So the technical term for that would be, um, or one of the aspects of how it could be harmful 
well below heating is what's called a resonance effect, meaning any, any object, whether it's biological or not, has uh, certain frequencies associated with it, whether it's a vibrational, uh, like physical sound vibration or, or other types of resonance, uh, every object has its own base frequency. So if you bombard that object with its own frequency, you can create basically a situation where it can, it can amplify that frequency, that vibration, until it causes damage to its, it, it causes uh, damage to that material. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, things that we're using examples of things that we're used to. Microwave oven. Most people have a microwave. The way a microwave works is it uses a specific frequency of EMF, uh, which is 2.4 gigahertz microwave, to heat the food. And what it's actually doing is that frequency is having a resonance with the water, the moisture in the food. So there, that's a resonance effect. It causes the water molecules to vibrate or oscillate or rotate and that friction that's generated from that water moving inside the food is actually what heats your food up when you stick it in the microwave so the point is is that if i if i change that frequency whether it's a little higher or a little lower the food might not heat up because i have to hit that exact frequency to get that resonance effect so um now that was an example of heating but you can have resonance effects that are not heating uh not due to heating and so the point is, is there's all kinds of things like, for example, one of the concerns with 5G, uh, so-called 5G, is 60 gigahertz uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, is absorbed by oxygen. So you can actually break oxygen molecules with 60 gigahertz because oxygen molecules absorb 60 gigahertz because that's the natural resonance of that molecule. But if you keep bombarding it with that frequency, you can eventually cause that molecular bond to break. Uh, a simple common analogy that some people might be familiar with to, to kind of explain that more is if you have like, you know, the old uh, the concept of the opera singer. She hits that high note and it shatters, shatters the wine glass. Yeah, that's because that specific note, not higher, not lower, but that specific note that she hits that she's singing was for that if glass it's loud enough. That glass happens to be at that frequency. And not the windows around her. Right. Because those are different. The, the, they're structured differently and they'll have a different resonance. But that particular frequency for that particular glass, you know, its structure, its composition, everything about it is unique. It has a certain frequency that is natural for it. And if you bombard it with a high enough intensity and, and uh, for long enough that it will start to amplify its own frequency until it shakes itself to pieces. It's a little bit of a simplification, but that general concept applies to, you know, every system in your body from organs to cells to everything else. You could pinpoint, you can pinpoint. a particular organ yeah. with frequency. Exactly. When, when a car drives brain, by with a you know. super loud sound system yep. and that one jar falls off, not all of the jars, that one book falls off your shelf and it pisses you off. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean? It's because it was hitting that frequency. Yeah, so the point is that the details matter and so a lot of this gets kind of glossed over. But anyway, I don't want to get super technical, but the point is, is there's a lot of information that, that people could be uh, learning about and understanding that, that gets ignored. So resonance effects is one. And then there's other things that have been found where it's, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive. Like we assume that more radiation or a higher intensity radiation is always worse and less radiation or a shorter uh, duration of radiation is always better. And sometimes that's true, but not always. So uh, I do have a meter that measures overall radiation and it usually just helps me pinpoint the sources of radiation. But um, really what you would need is other types of equipment, which I'm eventually gonna get like spectrum analyzer, which is basically a device that looks at individual frequencies. And then you can see, you know, what more detail about what frequency is being uh, generated and you know, whether or not uh, you're gonna be concerned about certain resonance effects or not, like I said, or even you know, some, some frequencies, of course, like I said, might be uh, therapeutic. So anyway, um, so the, some of the things that can be harmful are um, specific frequencies, you know, resonance effects, um, pulsing. So sometimes a pulsed signal, even at the same frequency as a continuous signal, in, in certain situations can be more harmful biologically, or what they call biologically active, than a continuous signal, just the way that, that the body reacts to that or, or tries to deal with that. And then modulation. Modulation is basically 
uh, embedding information within uh, the overall signal. So you might have a wave, what we call a sine wave, which is just a, a wave that goes like this. And then if you modulate that wave, maybe you now have like a smaller wave encoded. So like the wave itself is going up and down as the larger wave oscillates, you know, and, and that's very complicated. But basically that modulation, it's incoherent. So it creates an interference with the body that we're not used to. So like uh, as, a, as a flip side of that, you can look at like sunlight. Sunlight is a continuous wave, okay? Um, and, you know, barring, you know, sitting out in the sun all day, which, you know, you might get a sunburn, it may not be good, but, but you do need some sunlight. And the point is our body is used to natural light, natural EMF, and those are continuous. They're not pulsed, they're not modulated. They're, they're natural, clean uh, sine waves. Um, and that's what our body is used to at least, you know, within, within reason, moderation. So that's really the bottom line is there's all these detailed facets um, that we need to look at when we're doing consultation. Now with the meter that I do have, I just want to say real quick. So um, two things. One is the standards that I use to determine uh, whether something is harmful or not are basically based on a European model that's more uh, medically or holistically based known as the building biology standard. Um, and then there's other ones that are similar like geobiology, but basically those standards are a lot more stringent. And so for like EMF, um, you know, it's, uh, it's like three microwatts per square meter, which may not, may not mean a lot to most people, but just as a comparison in the U S I think the standard of what's considered safe is anything up to like 10 million microwatts per square meter. So we're looking for three microwatts um, because you have all these other potential harms that are well below, you know, what they claim is heating or ionization. Um, but anyway, so that's some of the basics. Um, and you can hear some of, so the one meter I have, if I turn it on real quick, just as a quick example, you can actually hear with the uh, speaker that it has, it, it translates some of the pulsing and modulation to a sound. So you can almost auditorially visualize what the pulsing is like. So if you've got your phone or your Wi-Fi or whatever device, um, this will kind of um, convert that to a sound as it's giving you the, the digital readout and telling you what the radiation level is. So you can actually get an idea of what, what your device is actually doing. I'll just turn this on real quick. I don't know what the radiation is in this room right now, but just we'll see what it says. That's what everybody wants to know watching this. Yeah. So like if I turn this on, you can hear it. And then the, the so there's an LED readout that's giving kind of a, a bar graph of the radiation level every second. And then the number on the bottom left here is giving what's the, what's the moment to moment reading. And then anytime there's a maximum, it, uh, the, the highest level that it's detected since I turned it on will be registered on the right side. So that's the peak radiation. And then if a, if a new high, higher level is registered, it'll update that number to the new highest that it's, that it's detected. Um, but you can hear that sound on the back and that's kind of creating that, that sound is being generated as a way to visualize through sound what the pulsing and and uh, modulation is so it's not a clear like continuous sound it's a da -da 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 -da, you can hear it right that's that's the the disruptive very uh incoherent sound that our bodies are being exposed to that they're not used to so it's like interference another analogy i use is like if you're talking on a radio or like a walkie talkie or you're trying to listen to your favorite song on the radio uh if you're in your car um that if you have someone else broadcasting on that same station that you're trying to listen to, it's inner, it's going to like overlap with the signal. You're not going to be able to hear. Right. So, or, or the, going back to the analogy of like, if you're talking to someone on a radio, like a two way radio and you're trying to get important information to them and then someone else is using that same frequency, they're going to override that communication and you won't be able to communicate. So just as an analogy, our body uses a lot of these, types of energy in its normal functioning. So the organs, the cells, they all communicate with each other with uh, not only chemical, but electrical and electromagnetic uh, frequencies. And if you're bombarding the body with those, with similar frequencies, it can interfere with that intercellular communication. And if you do that long enough over a period of years, it might not happen right away, 
But if it's chronic and you're exposed to it constantly, that interfering, that interference in those uh, internal functions could potentially lead to negative health effects, uh, you know, down the road. And that and that's part of the problem too. Is is people think, well, I I've I use my phone every day and I'm fine, but just because you don't get sick doesn't mean that it's not harmful. Like, it you know, everyone knows that smoking cigarettes is is harmful, but but everyone also knows that not every single person that smokes a cigarette is automatically going to get sick and die from it. But that doesn't mean that smoking cigarettes isn't dangerous. So just like that. You know these ra- these uh, types of radiation. Just because everyone doesn't get sick immediately and die, wouldn't be uh, evidence that it's not harmful. You know, you know sometimes being ill becomes such a norm that feeling normal is a high. Yeah, right. You know what I mean. Yeah, and that's so the other side we of it we too. you forget about yeah. And yeah, you just chronic get illness. so used. We get used to chronic, oh, chronically yeah, feeling bad, low energy, bad, poor sleep quality. You don't get a deep enough and sleep. You, and you don't you feel think rested. You think you just hate You're your job. Out. And, yeah, all and these you think things. All these things, and, you and just, that's not normal. No, We're supposed you just to feel don't calm. Know. Like people that if you go camping and you're out in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere and it's like, why do I feel so calm? It's not just that you've got the nice trees and nature. It's actually that if you're in a place that actually has low uh, fields that your body can actually relax because it's not getting that interference. So anyway, that's that's the long story, somewhat short. But uh, yeah, so that's that's a little bit of a, a, a peek into what I do um, to try to help people with the with these uh, fields that they're dealing with. Ken, that is amazing. Um, if anybody wanted to talk to you, could they leave messages on your website or your email? Yeah, you can contact me through the website. Uh, there is a contact form on there. They can also email me. Info's on that card there. Um, those are those are probably the best ways, email or through the website. Yeah. Super exciting. Dude, you never stop. You're pure passion. Thanks. Um, you're a great artist, but your passion is just so on the surface. You believe what you do. You do what you believe. And it's amazing. Most people are money first. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, your art is healing, and your your healing is art. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> so, folks, don't be afraid. Go ahead and message Ken if anyone's interested in any of his fantastic, high-quality, actual orgone devices. Maybe even if you just want a little bit of advice on what you're making at home. Ken has already said he wants you making real stuff. Yeah. He doesn't, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with what, your, your intention and direction is good, but Ken wants to help you take it to another level. You should be doing seminars, dude. Yeah. And uh, Maybe I will. Yeah, you will. I know you will. You are the real deal. I should have checked him out, folks. I could talk to you forever. Yeah. You're great. I appreciate your time. I know it's getting late now, so people probably want to rest but over there in that box ken came to the tucson show yeah. to buy high quality material shungite skyrocketed on you huh i know it's very expensive it's hard to even get let alone pay the high <laughs> price for it um, but yeah i got some uh brazilian quartz some lemurian style in such a short time you've become one of those guys i remember when it was this price right oh man i wish i had bought more <laughs> then when it was cheap you know um, you're not after the powder. You like the you like the elite. Yeah, the yeah. The, the higher quality material. Yeah, the what they call the noble or type one, uh, you know, carbon fullerene or carbon shungite. Yeah. Um, before we go, not that there's anything wrong with people that might like it, but in for what you're vibing, you're not particularly into the Colombian stuff that they're calling shungite nowadays. Um, you know, I'm just hesitant because I, I don't know enough about it. And I think there's a lot of controversy and a lot of uncertainty on to whether or not it's really the same. And so I'm just kind of waiting. You used a certain term for something that's inside of the Shungite that's not the carbon 60. Maybe we begin with an F. Oh, fullerene. That's like it's it's so it's a reference to Buckminster Fuller, who kind of uh, made the geodesic what structures. What a name. Yeah. <laughs> And so the geodesic structure uh, was associated with his work. And so when they discovered carbon 60, meaning that it's 60 atoms of carbon, and there's other forms too, like carbon 72 and so on, um, where it's like a spherical or semi-spherical uh, like uh, shape, 
of the molecule. It almost looks like a like a hollow soccer ball lattice structure, but it's that geodesic type geometric structure um, that they discovered this carbon 60 um, ha has that shape that, that goes back to some of the work of Buckminster Fuller. So I guess that, that name got popular uh, because it connected to him, so they call it a fullerene. Uh, I think it's also, some people call it Bucky Balls, you know, oh, like wow. Buck, Buckminster Fuller. So <laughs> it's pretty funny. But yeah, that's that's what it's referring to. If you don't mind me asking, Ken, I'd love to have you on the channel uh, doing a live Zoom call or something uh, for a Q&A. Oh, yeah. Because there's people out there like, you didn't ask him about this, David, you got to ask him about and this. And we're both tired right now, so we're trying to think of what would people be My asking. voice is gone. Yeah. I, I threw, like, well, almost a month that in. for another time. My voice is gone. Yeah. You can just, if you if you folks been watching all the videos from Tucson, you yeah. can just gradually hear my voice deteriorate into nothing. Um, I love you, Ken. I, You're I a brother to me, yeah, dude. And, um... It's not a coincidence that uh, we keep you around. You're big medicine, dude. Thanks, man. You're brilliant, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Yeah. Whatever it is, it's going to be for everyone. That's for sure. You're amazing. Kenneth Go Golner? Golner. Yeah. Golner. Oh, I got yeah, it. You can call me Ken. <laughs> can we call you Kenny G? <laughs> right. <laughs> you get that a lot, huh? Sometimes. It's all right. <laughs> I love you, Ken. Check him out, www.orgone.rocks, yeah. or um, send him an email there. Yeah. If you're in the Prescott, Prescott, you, you guys are Prescott people. Yeah. Most people Prescott people. Find him. Uh, if you have any suggestions for any Arizona metaphysical fairs or science fairs, not science fairs, that's, anyway, <laughs> if you have any suggestions that would, for places. That would be an interesting science fair. <laughs> It could be, you know, like a like a, a Nikola Tesla or, or someone like that. Uh, you know, it, it's it's ironic that here in the West we seem to be more uh, resistant to new ideas. But that's another topic for another day. If you know where this man needs to be talking to people at, if you have any ideas, message him and let him know. He's extremely open-minded. He didn't come up with this from looking it up on Google right before we went live. <laughs> this is stuff you've been doing research over, for a, a decade. Yeah. yeah, for a lot longer than you've even been practicing. Yeah. Like this is the real deal passion for you. Yeah. We can go on and on and on forever. I love Kenneth. Check out Kenneth Golner, www.orgone.rocks. If anyone's interested in any custom pieces, because you're running low. Yeah. You can make them something yeah, I'll be special. Making more soon, but I can do some custom work too. Is there a spread of what you can make on your website? There's a lot of examples on there. Yeah, I have some samples of different shapes I can make, or you can just ask me. Uh, one of the ones I I used to do that I can I can make is like a what they call like the Celtic. It's like a three-way spiral. Oh, this is right here. Triskelion. Yeah, that's actually my little symbol there. Yeah, so I can do ones like that. Uh, I can do pyramids, I can do little domes. Uh, so, yeah. Thanks, Ken. Thank you. See you soon, brother. Take care.